So we're here with Vusi Timbukwayo. I don't need to introduce this man. Vusi, if, if you're a South African and you don't know who Vusi is, there's something wrong with you. I mean, Vusi <laughs> has been on every show in South Africa. He's a successful businessman, thousands of followers on social media. Vusi, thank you for making your time to join us here in Worldview. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So, Vusi, straight to the points. I mean, South Africa is not working at the moment. What went wrong? Wow, that's such a big question. Um, it's a big question because it's not only multifaceted, but it's also multi generational. So, um, and and I, you know, I think one of the things we have to do is to resist the urge to simplify an issue because we might not have the tools to deal with its complexity, right? So there are a few things to say. First, South Africa wasn't perfect, right? So we, we've, we've, we, so we need to set that aside immediately. And the reason that's important, Donald, is because certainly it's been my experience that the minute you criticize what's not working, what's thrown back at you is, but the, the other thing wasn't perfect either. So we need to go, well, we know that wasn't perfect. What we're talking about here, and if I understand your question is, What's been the reason for the degrade? And the decay has been quite marked, particularly over the recent past. It's actually very simple. It's leadership. It's not complex. And we can throw that about and we can deal with the complexity of that. But at, at, at the heart of it is South Africa has a dire crisis um, in leadership. And do you blame the system or weak leaders? I think the two are I think the two are incestuous. I think poorly designed systems create um and breed the kind of leaders that we've seen in South Africa. Um and that's such a big word again. Sure, Donald, this word system. So you know when we talk about system, what do we actually mean? And and I think that there are a number of things South Africans don't think about, which is encapsulated in the word system are some externalities which we have to deal with, right? You you can't deal with the very marked decay in, in the quality of leadership we've seen in South Africa, particularly stewardship. We don't, we've suffered from having good stewards, people who understand the responsibility of the day and who are seized with making sure that they create a future better than the present that they inherit. Uh, or that they inhabit rather. Um, and a big part of that system is our education system, which in and of itself is a completely different conversation. But the mass miseducation of South Africans, particularly those of lower strata without economic means, has, has played right into the hands of those who have enjoyed and, and, and some might even say have designed the decay that we are seeing today. We, we have to, as South Africans, lose the naivety of mm -hmm. presuming that because things aren't working, um, that's the case for everybody. Things mm -hmm. not working is something working for somebody whose agenda is making sure things don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we have to be alive to that, that, that there's constantly an agenda, especially if it's one that doesn't suit our collective good. So just to dive a bit deeper into that, do you think the ANC actually has an agenda of keeping people uneducated? No. No, I don't think that they have a deliberate, intentional agenda to ensure the miseducation of the masses. And I hate that word, the masses, but you know, let's go with it. But I do think that it, it is, it's an, it's an, it's an unfortunate ally. To their political strategy, it uh, it's one that that plays nicely into um, into how they have come to do politics. Sadly, um, yeah. So so no, I don't think that they wake up in the morning and go, "How do we miseducate you know an entire generation?" But I think that as the the quality of their body politic decays. Um, a miseducation plays into that agenda because then the engagement with the public and with a voting fodder um, is not as robust as it otherwise would have been if they were dealing with with um, um, a, 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 a cohort in 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 civilians who who 
whose whose average level of critical thinking was such that they would be engaged with some of these issues differently to what we are seeing today. And I, I know that's a lot of big English, but the short answer is no, they're not doing it on purpose, but yes, it does play into their strategy. And so, you know, so, so be it. They're doing it sort of indirectly, if I understand you correctly. Even then, I don't think they're doing it at all. I just think, I just think that they, I suppose the question becomes, how much credit do you give a bad captain? If, if a ship sails in a particular direction mm. and it's the iceberg, right? And and the captain didn't even know the ship was sailing in that direction. Do you blame him for hitting the iceberg? Mm. And that's kind of South Africa's problem. We're, we're dealing with load shedding, which is an iceberg, when actually the problem we should be dealing with is how did we get here in the first place? Direction, right? Yeah. Um, and so And so a big part of what we have to contest amongst ourselves and contend with is before we even have a question and a conversation about outcomes, let's just have a question and a conversation about quality of inputs. We've got a severe quality of inputs problem, just quality of inputs in terms of the talent pool from which we're drawing people who go into the public service, in particular into the political class. Um, and as a consequence of that, these are some of the things that we're seeing. It, it's a bit like telling a it's it's that second level of ignorance when somebody doesn't know that they don't know. Don't Let know. me say to you this way, Donald. Um, a fortnight ago, I was on a plane, and I, I and there was this fellow on the plane sitting sitting adjacent me uh, across me, and he um, he was reading some literature, which piqued my interest. It seemed to be something about banking, and and as as you know, you know one of my businesses in the financial services space. So I thought this was interesting. Um, and then I, I kind of, you know, as he went to the bathroom, my eye wandered yonder over the aisle to have a look at what this fellow was reading. And he was reading like grade five level of information about banking. What is a bank? What is a bank account? What is fractional reserve banking? This is what he's reading in a file. So I thought that's interesting. I'm wondering why is he sitting in business class? Anyway, eventually as we disembark, I thought, I've got to ask him. So I pulled out my hand, I introduced myself, and I said, what do you do? He says he's a member of parliament. And I thought, well, there's your answer, my friend. And I, I imagine he's in one of the portfolio committees that has something to do with the financial services system, something to do with, but that you have somebody at that level of public service who's reading that level of, of, of literature is to me the question about direction, not the iceberg. Let's hope he's not a minister of finance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But, uh, but Busi, okay, you've eloquently described the problem. How do you see us climbing out of this? What do you see as a solution to all of this? That's such a tough question. Um, there are three things, four things that kind of have to fall together. The first of the ingredient is the one that I actually am not sure South Africans have had a conversation about. Here's the question. Do we want to fix it? It's a question nobody dares ask, really. And we're so concerned with our own petty political issues and winning one narrow little battle that, you know, either poses you as woke or representative or, you know, um, we're so concerned with making sure that we've got just the right number of people in the room with just the right complexion and just the right gender, that the quota is perfectly just so, that nobody's there asking the question, do we even know why we're in this room in the first place? So perhaps that's actually the first question for South Africans to ask themselves, do we want to fix it? A bit like when you're in a relationship, whether it's a business relationship or a romantic relationship, the first step when things are severed, if you go and see a third party, they're going to ask you the question, do you guys still want to repair this? Right? Because there's no point going down the path of all of this repair work when there's no desire to repair. And if you watched uh, the incidents of, of over the past week or so, this quote unquote shutdown, I think that there are members of our society who have no desire to, to fix, who have no desire to, to find each other. 
um, because it's just so much easier to destroy, to to um, coerce. Um, it's so much easier to malign, to rebuke, to name call, and to dismiss than it is to try and genuinely build a bridge and go, you're there, I'm here. How do we find each other? So I would say long before we talk about fixing it, let's talk about whether or not we want to fix it. Right, Daddy. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great move moment for him to make an appearance. <laughs> well, we should ask him quickly, ask him, what does he think it should happen? <laughs> yeah. What a good opportunity. Oh, wow. Yes. But okay, for, but for me, for me, it brings immediately the question uh, the whole tension, a wonderful creative tension between. Uh, loyalty and competency, because it seems like this is at this the point of the drama that it's playing out at the moment. Mm. Uh, what what do I sacrifice more of in favor of the other? Mm. And yeah, mm. Mm. it's a very good point, uh, Leon. So you know, my my he's my youngest, and he's five. Yeah. And um, the people watching this who have children will know, as you gents do that when you multiply yourself, something in you changes. Uh, you don't have the same relationship with the world the minute you, you have children. And so it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us, Leon, to, to do the tough work today so that they don't have to. Mm. And my, my biggest concern, this is, this is the one thing that keeps me up at night, is this. It is that our generation is failing in its duty to address the difficulties we face. And rather what we're doing is we're hitting this par five down the green and hoping the next generation is gonna catch it. Mm. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. <clears throat> I think it was Thomas Sal that said, there are no perfect solutions. Um, you know, I think it was something like, there are no perfect solutions, only uh, competing interests or, you know, mm. but at the end of the day, there, there are there are these trade-offs, was the word he mm. used, and you're dead mm. right. We're mm. seized with a moment today where we have to think about, you know, do we continue to vote like soccer fans, you know, because mm. we, we love the team and we've supported our entire lives and we grew up in a family that loves the team and your dad loved the team and your granddad mm. loved the team. You used to go to the stadiums and you remember all of the old players. Or do we begin to, to behave like citizens? And to, to recognize that as a citizen, you should have a performance scorecard that you hold your, your public officials to mm. and, and that you have a responsibility, a civic duty almost, to hold them to that scorecard, um, regardless of how you might feel about them, that you've got to make cognitive decisions about what is in the best interest of, of our country. Mm.